Well, happy Mother's Day to you. We are, we've been in a series on, uh, on David, and we've been studying his life, but we're going to take a break from that today. But we're going to kind of stick with the theme of characters this morning. And this morning I want to talk with you about Mary and the faith of Mary, Jesus' mother. Here's what I want to do, because I think sometimes when, when we come to Scripture, and we, when we think about faith, I, I think sometimes that we don't always think about this incredible person named Mary. I, I don't think that our minds get wrapped around the faith that she had in her life to go through the things that she went through, to be asked to do the kinds of things that she was asked to do. Sometimes I think we think that Mary really has nothing to teach me about faith, but we're going to find out today that Mary has a lot to teach us about faith. So go ahead, get your worship folders out that you were handed when you came in, pull out those notes, you're going to want to follow along with me, a scripture will be in your notes this morning, and you can follow along, all the fill in the blanks will be on the, on the screens. If you don't like to use the paper or whatever, you can watch the screens and scripture will be up there for you also. We're going to look at Mary's life. We're going to kind of let it guide us and and talk together about where faith begins and where faith leads and how God can work in my life and in your life in an awesome way to bring about genuine faith. So we're going to jump right into this this morning. Learning from the life of Mary. You'll see at the top of your notes, there's kind of a big header. It says, where does faith begin in my life? And that's where I want to start this morning. I want to start with this whole idea of where does faith begin in my life? We're going to find out that for Mary, it kind of starts in a strange place, if you really think about it. But she's also going to act like many of us do when it comes to this idea of faith. She's going to go through some of the same experiences, some of the same stages or steps that we go through in life when it comes to faith. Here Mary began with this whole thing of faith when God came and God challenged her faith. I want to look at three words this morning on how faith begins. So number one in your notes. First of all, faith begins sometimes with confusion. Faith begins sometimes with confusion. That's where Mary began. If you know anything about her life, you'll you'll know that that's true. It started with confusion. Look at your notes and look at Luke in chapter 1, verses 28 through 29. It says, And the angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by the statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. So immediately, when God told her, you're blessed, I'm going to do something in your life, her immediate reaction was confusion. She was confused. Confused because she didn't understand who she was. Confused because she didn't understand who God is. In fact, those are the very two reasons that many of us get confused. First, we get confused because we don't understand who we are. That's how Mary felt. She didn't understand who she was, so she felt this confusion in her life. An angel comes to her and says, Hey Mary, you are truly blessed. Now, that address that was given to her, you're truly blessed, that was something that was, that was held in high regard. That was a kingly address. That was the way you addressed a king in those days. Somebody with a robe on would get that kind of an address. So here's a peasant teenage girl. An angel shows up and says, you are truly blessed. You see, it didn't fit Mary's image of who she was. It didn't fit her image of what she thought of herself. But what about you? I want you to think about that for a second. What about you? How do you really picture yourself? How do you picture yourself? What if I said to you, you are truly loved? Would that be a good picture of yourself? You know, we know John 3, 16, whether you've been in church your entire life or this is your first time ever stepping through the doors of a church, you've probably heard this verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. But does that fit your picture of yourself? Does it fit the idea that you have for yourself? We don't understand. 
Mary didn't understand who God is. The first feeling that she had was this feeling of fear. Have you ever felt that way? When God has come and challenged your faith, have you ever felt fear? You know there's something to it, but you're just a little bit afraid to take that step. You feel like, I don't know if I can live up to that. I don't know if, if, if I even want that in my life. I, I just don't know. I don't know if I can get that. There's a little bit of fear in it. You see, I think that's the way we all feel sometimes when our faith is challenged. That's why so often in the Bible, there's always these three little words that go along when, when Jesus comes and, and talks to them or, or whatever. There's always these three little words because they come up again and again and again. And what did they say to Mary? Hey, Mary, don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. I guess that's actually four words. Do not be afraid. God needs to say it again and again and again because we feel it again and again and again. One of my favorite places to go when we talk about this whole idea of fear is John 14, 27. And John is writing in his biography of Jesus. Give it to me on the screen there. John is writing in his biography of Jesus. He says, peace I have with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. When I feel afraid, I can turn to him and he'll give me peace into my life. And he's going to help me to be able to face that challenge that he's putting in front of me. Don't be afraid, but instead, God says, turn to me. The first feeling that I have is confusion and fear many times. How do I get from this confusion, this fear, to a place of commitment? Here's the second thing. A second word that I want you to write in your outline. Number two, questions. Write it down. Questions. You see, this is key. If you want to have a genuine, deep faith, you've got to ask God questions sometimes. It's honestly, if I really think about what are one of the keys to faith, I think this is really one of the keys to faith. And if you think that people of great faith never ask God questions, then you haven't read your Bible. Because they did. They all asked God questions. Abraham was called the father of our faith. He asked questions all the time, didn't he? Moses always asking questions. Mary here, she's going to ask a question in just a minute here. Paul was asking questions of God all the time. All the people who had genuine faith, they were asking questions. But here's the key. They asked the questions, but they listened for an answer. You do this, don't you? You ask a question, but you never listen. You ask a question, but you never listen for the answer. And you see, that's key. We do that. It's like in our family when your husband or, or your wife and, or your kids or whatever and, and, you, and you say something like this. What were you thinking? Is that a question that requires an answer? No. That is not a question. You don't want an answer. You're simply making a statement. Like that was a really dumb thing to do. And sometimes with God, we ask a question, but we don't listen for an answer. And the difference is when you ask and then you listen. And that's what Mary did. She had a question. An angel comes and says something to her and there was a question in her mind. Luke 1.34 says this. It says, Mary asked the angel, how can this be since I have not had sexual relations with a man? That's a good question. Wouldn't you agree? That's a good question. It's a very good question. That's a question that everybody would ask if they were in the same situation as Mary. How can this be? But see, that question led her to faith. When she was first told she was going to have a baby, she knew that it could not be possible. And trust in God often brings us face to face with the impossible in our lives. Now, for most of us, it's not as dramatic as what Mary went through but it is real to you, isn't it? It's real to you. Let's, little, let's look a little closer at what helped her to be able to ask the questions. Listen for an answer and then make a commitment of faith. 
How did this happen in her life? Well, she looked to three different places. She looked within her, she looked around her, and then she looked above her. We'll get right into those, so just leave number one up there for me. Those are the three places that I have to look if I want to find faith. First of all, you have to look within you. You have to look within you. Now, when I say looking within you, I'm not talking about the force within you or anything like that. It's not what I mean. Mary was encouraged by an angel to realize God's Holy Spirit has come upon her. And when a spirit comes upon you, then you're going to be with child. That's what she told Mary. When you become a follower of Jesus Christ, God's Holy Spirit comes into your life to give you God's presence and that's with you every day of your life. But there is some mystery to that, isn't there? I mean, if we're honest with each other this morning, if we really sit down and look at this, there's some mystery to this whole thing. That's a big thing. But the incredible thing is, the awesome thing is, when God's Spirit is in your life, that means any moment of any day, you can say, God, would you give me your wisdom? Would you give me your understanding? You look within you, not to yourself. You look to the Holy Spirit. Number two, you look around you. You look around you. Mary was almost instantly, immediately encouraged to go and be with Elizabeth, who was kind of in the same situation with John the Baptist. Here's somebody else facing much of the same circumstance. And the angel said, Mary, why don't, you do, why don't you go be around somebody who can help encourage your faith in this whole situation, Mary? When your faith is being challenged, you need to get around people who can encourage you, who can encourage your faith. You want to get around people that can help you see that the impossible can be possible with God. But there's a lot of people in your life, isn't there? There's a lot of people in your life that they want you to see that the possible is impossible. You found that to be true? There's a lot of people in our lives like that, isn't there? That we look around and we see a possible situation, but we have somebody who encourages us that it's an impossible situation. Yeah, we all have that. But what about the person with genuine faith? Find those kind of people. Surround yourself with those kind of people who are gonna encourage your faith who are going to build your faith up. So you look within you, you look around you, and number three, you look above you. You look above you. Nothing is impossible, but the last two words are crucial, with God. Nothing is impossible with God. This isn't just positive thinking stuff. Nothing is impossible for you. No, that's not true. Nothing is impossible with God. Through positive thinking, you might be able to get somewhere and a little bit more in your life at at times, but it is only with God that you get nothing is impossible. So you look to him, and what can he do? And you ask these questions, and you listen for these answers, but sometimes it starts with confusion. I'm not sure what I'm doing here. I'm not sure what I'm doing in this whole situation. And I begin to ask questions and I begin to listen and Mary heard an awesome answer. Nothing is impossible with God. Number three. Number three is commitment. Commitment. There comes a point where I've heard the answer and now I've got to step across the line. I've got to make a commitment and Mary did. She made a commitment. Look at Luke 1.38. It's an amazing verse. It says, I am the Lord's servant, said Mary. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel left her. This, th- this is an amazing moment if you think about it. Isn't it? This is an amazing moment. There are two absolutely amazing things that we learn from this very simple verse. Now, I didn't put these in your notes, but you can write them down if you want to. First of all, Mary immediately puts her faith in God. Mary immediately puts her faith in God. Here is this simple peasant girl who had grown up, maybe, maybe she knew a hundred people. She hasn't been everywhere. She hasn't seen everything. She's grown up in this little, small village, and when this angel comes to her, she's a teenager at the time. 
She'd never experienced the kinds of things that even you've experienced. She's never seen even the kind of things that you've seen. She didn't know how to read. She couldn't write in the culture that she was in because in that culture, they didn't teach the girls that. Yet God comes and challenges her her faith. And then somehow she knew that everything in life, up to this point, everything in life was going to change. She knew she didn't understand it and other people wouldn't understand it, but she said, I'm the Lord's servant. I'm the Lord's servant. She immediately put her faith in God. You know what? I want to learn from that kind of faith, don't you? I want to learn from that kind of faith. I want to have that kind of faith in my life. The other amazing thing to me about this verse is here is the God of the universe and he's waiting on a yes from a teenager. That's amazing to me. I don't have teenagers yet. Uh, I was a youth pastor for a few years while I was uh, at Moody Bible Institute and I've seen how some of them act. Thankfully, I could send them home. Because uh, I didn't have to worry about them. Once, once, I was, once my hour and a half was done with those kids, I'd just send them home. I didn't have to worry about them anymore. So think about this, though. Here is God, the God of the universe, and he's waiting on a yes from a teenage girl. That's just amazing to me. Just amazing to me. Her faith, though, played a part in it, didn't it? Mary's faith played a part in it. God knew that she was going to say yes. He knew what he he was going to do in in the life of Mary, but her faith played a part in this. Just like your faith plays a part in what God is doing in your life, how he's working in your life, Mary said yes. Someone said the world's most common prayer is, thy will be changed. And I think that's true, don't you? God says, I want to to do something in your life, and and here's how I want it to do, and we go, oh, God, could we just tweak it just a little bit? Just, you know, just just a little tweak here, and and then I'm good with it. But you see, Mary refused that prayer and said very simply, thy will be done. Be it done to me as you have said. She begins by saying, I am the Lord's servant. She was set free like never before and she began to have this life of faith with Jesus Christ. I want you to see with me, to be honest about where this kind of faith will lead to and that's your next kind of big point in your notes there. Where this kind of faith leads I just want to walk through Mary's life and and kind of hit some of the high places of where this life of faith that Mary was called to. I just want to hit some of these high points in her life. Because I don't want you walking out of here today thinking, well, if I have faith, then I'm just going to live this fairy tale Disneyland kind of life where there's no problems. That's not what we're talking about this morning. There's no such promise. I don't know about you but I'm looking forward to heaven where there's no more problems, no more tears, no more crying, no more pain. I'm looking forward to that day. But until we get there, we have this life on earth, a life of faith, which is an exciting, adventurous life, but it's a real life, isn't it? It's a real life. And Mary, as we, as we walk through her life, we get to see how do I live a life of faith. Jesus is born. The Savior of the world comes comes right here to our planet, to earth. And in Bethlehem, they see shepherds and they see wise men come and then they begin to live this life of faith. Let me just walk you through some of the high points of this life and see what we can learn from Mary's life of faith. Where does faith lead? It led for Mary and Joseph, it led to Egypt, didn't it? It led to Egypt. Look at Matthew 2.13. It's in your notes. Matthew writes, After they were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Get up, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to kill him. So here's Mary and Joseph. 
They had gone to Bethlehem, and, and, and baby Jesus is born there. And they end up, they ultimately end up staying there for quite a little while because we know that just based off of history and tradition that the wise men probably never even showed up until Jesus was about two years old. So we know they've been in Bethlehem for a little while. I'm sure that they're sitting there going, man, I can't wait until we get to go home. I mean, don't you want to raise your kid at home? You always want to raise it at home. And that's what they were looking forward to. And then an angel comes and says, no, you know what? You're going to go to Nazareth. I, you're, you're, I mean, you're not going to go to Nazareth. I'm going to send you in the exact opposite direction. You're going to Egypt. You're going to a place that you don't know, to a place that you're not comfortable with. And that's where you're going to be for a few years because that's how I have to protect Jesus. So number one, faith leads to problems. Faith leads to problems. That's where it leads sometimes. Because they had baby Jesus, they had to live in Egypt. If they didn't have baby Jesus, they could have just gone to Nazareth. But their faith wasn't always convenient, was it? It wasn't always fun and games. It wasn't always easy to have Jesus as their son. It wasn't always easy, but it was better. It wasn't always fun, but it was better. So the question is, are you looking for an easy and fun life? Is that all you're looking for in life? Just an easy and fun life? Let me tell you something. It's not going to satisfy you. But you probably already know that. If all you're looking for is an easy, fun life, it's not going to satisfy you. It's not going to satisfy you. Are you looking for a better life? Are you looking for a great life? A better life of what God wants to do in your life? A great life of how God wants to develop your character and use you to make a difference, a significant difference in this world? Mary and Joseph experienced that. But as they experienced it, they realized that faith often leads to problems. So here's the truth. While we live in this world, listen, get this, while we live in this world, we're going to have problems. While we live in this world, we're going to have problems. We all know that. Every one of us sitting here this morning, we all know that. The question is, what set of problems do you want to live with? The kind that go with faith or the kind that goes with your selfishness and your pride? You see, I'd rather live with the problems that go with faith because those are problems that come out of significance. Those are the problems that God uses to grow me, that God uses to change me, that God uses to develop me. Faith even leads to problems sometimes. But God uses even those problems to grow you, doesn't he? He uses those problems to grow you. He uses those problems to change you. Where else does faith lead? Well, it led to Egypt, but it also led to a temple for Mary and Joseph and Jesus. This is when Jesus was 12 years old. We're just kind of walking through the life of, of Mary here, kind of looking at some of these highlights. Jesus is 12, and they went up as they usually did to the Passover feast in Jerusalem. They traveled from the town they were in, Nazareth at the time, and so they would have gone to Jerusalem. This would have been a really long journey for them. And then after they're done with the feast, they they head on home. So let's kind of break in the story. Let's see what happens on the way home. Luke writes this in Luke chapter 2. He says, after those days were over, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming he was in the traveling party, they went a day's journey, then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. Do you see what's happening here? They lost the Son of God. I mean, how do you do that? I mean, they had one thing in life that they were supposed to do, take care of Jesus, and they lose him. This is not a good day for Mary and Joseph, let me tell you what, all right? We don't know where he is. He was with us, but now he's not with us anymore. What in the world is going on here? How could they not know for a whole day that Jesus was with them? 
Here's what was happening in that culture of that day. In that culture of that day, Jesus was being about 12 years old. He was right on the verge of being a man or still being a boy. And when they traveled together, the men traveled in one area and the ladies traveled in another area in that culture. And so Mary thinking, well, he's a man. He's, he's, he's up there with Joseph. And Joseph's thinking, well, he's still a boy. So he's back with Mary. Have your parents ever done this to you? I can't tell you how many times I got left at church. I'm serious. And my parents would come and they'd find me and I'd say, didn't you know I'd be about my father's business? They just thought one had the other one. They said, no, that's all that was going on here. But you know where else faith leads? Number two, faith leads to surprises. Faith leads to surprises. This bad day for Mary and Joseph becomes the one moment in all of Jesus' childhood that we really ever hear about. You ever thought about that? You hear about his birth and then you really don't hear anything until he's 12 and then you really don't hear anything until he's 30. We also get to hear about the fact that they lost Jesus, but we also get to hear about this incredible day that they had. Where does faith lead? It leads to Egypt. It led to a temple. It also led to a wedding in Cana. Now Jesus is 30, and we're walking through just this life of Mary. He's about ready to begin his, his public ministry. Mary and Jesus, they go to this wedding together. Look at John. John writes this. John writes, when the wine ran out, Jesus' mother told him, they don't have any wine. This is kind of actually a fascinating expression interchange to me. Here's Jesus, he's 30 years old, and his mom is still nudging him on what to do. You ever thought about that? You see what's going on here? Mary recognizes something. She recognizes Jesus is about to begin his public ministry. And he could work a miracle of turning water into wine. And you can go and read scholars on this. And some people say that Mary was completely out of line in this whole interchange. And other people say that, well, you know, she was just noticing that Jesus was ready to begin his public ministry, whatever it is. I really don't know, to be honest with you. But she knew that Jesus was special. And that Jesus could do something here. He could do something. She, in a sense, is releasing him into his public ministry in this moment. She understands something in the depth of her soul about God and about the life of Jesus. So you know where else faith leads? Number three, faith leads to opportunities. Faith leads to opportunities. Write that down. Faith leads to opportunities. Mary's in the right place at the right time and she says the right thing and and, and it opens the door. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. There's something about God's will that I'm sure that you've begun to begin to discover. That is, you can't schedule God's will. Have you noticed that in your life? God, I'm going to do this then, and this then, and say this then. I remember after the first church I pastored, it was a, a and this is, uh, I don't know, this, it's not a bash against the Southern Baptist at all. But I I, I passed a Southern Baptist church. And after that first church, I I looked at Missy one day and I said, I'm never pastoring a Southern Baptist church ever again. And we went and we started a church and everything else. And the very next church I pastored was what? A Southern Baptist church. Why? Because God had a plan. And even though it wasn't necessarily my plan, God had a plan. God, we say it so often though, don't we? God, I'm gonna do this then, I'm gonna do this then, and I'm gonna do this then. And it doesn't work that way. But see, faith leads to opportunity. We're in the right place at the right time and you say the right thing and God works through it. And that's where faith leads sometimes, doesn't it? To opportunities. Faith leads to a wedding in Cana, faith also leads Mary to the foot of the cross. Faith also led Mary to the foot of the cross. John, he's writing in his biography, he says in chapter 19, verse 25, standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother. I cannot imagine that moment, can you? 
Can you even begin to imagine the moment as Mary is standing at the foot of the cross, watching Jesus, her son, die on the cross, not fully understanding at this point in her life that Jesus is going to come back from the dead, not fully understanding that he was doing this for the forgiveness of our sins, but she knew she had held him. She knew she had loved him all of his life, and now confusion again, right? Confusion again. Here he is dying on the cross, and I can't even begin to imagine the emotions that were going on then. I don't think any of us could. I don't think any of us could. But I do know it teaches me. It reminds me of another place that faith leads, number four. Faith sometimes leads to a broken heart. Faith sometimes leads to a broken heart. Mary's heart was broken that day, wasn't it? It was broken that day. And some of you think, then why have faith? If faith is going to just lead me to a broken heart, then why have faith? In this world, folks, listen. In this world, you're going to have a broken heart. You're going to be broken by something. Or else you're going to feel it from being broken so much that you become something ugly. Your heart is going to be broken by something. Is your heart going to be broken by your selfishness and the result of that selfishness and the hurt you bring into other people's lives? Or is your heart going to be broken by the things of God? And that's only a question that you can answer. Faith leads to a heart that's broken by what God really cares about. A heart that's broken by our own sin and what that's done to our own life and what it's done to somebody else's life. A heart that's broken by someone you know who could be a part of God's family and you're praying that, it would, that they would, that they would understand the goodness of God. That they would see how awesome God is and how great God is for their lives, but they just won't do it. And your heart breaks. A heart that's broken for the needs around the world. I didn't mention this when we started off, but every month we get the awesome opportunity to partner with different agencies all around the world that are supplying needs for kids. And all you simply have to do, and I'll let you do this right now. You can get your phone out, get your smartphone out and check in right here at Calvary Bible Church. And with that little check-in, you help provide this month this care for, care for moms and their children all around the world through um, Compassion International. That's our mission partner this month. And all you have to do is a simple little check-in. A heart that's broken for the needs around the world. You see, faith leads to a broken heart, but it doesn't have to end there. Out of that broken heart can come new things that God wants to do in our life. Out of that broken heart, Mary then sees the resurrection of Jesus, a new hope for the world, for her. Out of that broken heart, let me take you to a new place in Mary's life. Listen to what happens in the book of Acts as this new church is getting started that really Jesus is beginning. Did you know that that Mary was there when the church was instituted? She was there. The church that her son, the son of God, started. The Bible says in Acts 1.14, they they all were continually united in prayer along with the women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Think about this day for Mary. Mary. She's sitting in in the church that her son started, Jesus. And she's there with her brothers. And remember, all through Jesus' life, for most of it, Jesus' brothers mocked him, made fun of him, even called him a lunatic at times, which you probably would too, because he never did anything wrong. I would, yeah, I would think my brother's a lunatic for not ever doing anything wrong. And they're all sitting there on this day This new church is beginning and Mary's a part of it. Number five, faith leads to purpose. Faith leads to purpose. To the purpose that God has for your life, which is bigger and greater than any purpose I can come up with for my own life or for anybody else's life. Mary was there. That's where faith led. You see, God has a purpose for your life that's above and beyond what you can even begin to imagine. 
He has a purpose for your life that's going to fulfill that whole. Augustine said years and years and years ago, he said everybody is born with a God-shaped vacuum in them. And the whole idea of that is we are all searching for something. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your background is this morning. I don't care if you go to church or not go to church. We are all searching for something in life, something that is bigger and and, and better than, than what we have. And God has a purpose for your life that is far beyond anything you can ever begin to imagine, but also that need for love that all of us have, that need for relationship and that need for connection. Also that need in your life for knowing that you have hope knowing that you have a future. That's the kind of purpose that he wants to put into everybody's lives. But it begins with commitment. This life of faith for Mary began the day when she said, I am the Lord's servant. Be it done to me as you have said. She didn't know it, but that day, God had in mind Egypt. God had in mind the temple. God had in mind the wedding in Cana, and God had in mind the cross, and God had in mind the upper room in Jerusalem. You see, God saw it all, and he sees it for your life. It begins with that moment of commitment. So I want to go back to that moment, just real quick, and we'll close with this. And I want to listen to a song that Mary sang. It's really a prayer that Mary prayed, and it's found in Scripture. I want to learn from it together. It's in your notes. It's found in Luke, starting in verse 46, and it says, And Mary said, My soul praises the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, because he has looked with favor on the humble condition of of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. Because the mighty one has done great things for me, and his name is holy. His mercy is from generation to generation on those who fear him. Let me invite you to make that a prayer of your life. A prayer of your life, a prayer of commitment. To let Mary teach us that this is really ultimately a prayer of faith. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you so much for this life of Mary. And Father, what she has to teach us about faith. Father, faith is an area I think that many, many, many of us struggle with. We struggle with this whole idea of faith and where it leads us sometimes. And sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it leads us to a life of problems. Sometimes it leads us to surprises but it always leads to purpose. And Father, I pray that we just see that faith, that we can learn from the faith that Mary had. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and I don't know all of you here this morning. And I don't know where your heart is with God this morning. But maybe you're sitting here saying, you know what, it's got to start with commitment for me. And my commitment first needs to start with making a commitment of Jesus in my life, of making Jesus Lord of my life. And if you're sitting here this morning and you're saying, Andrew, I want that commitment. I want Jesus to come into my life. I want his spirit to come in me so that I can have a relationship with you, God, so that I can experience the love that I can only find through Jesus. If that's you, The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, it says if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus raised from the dead, then we will be saved. But you see, it's a heart commitment. It's not about just knowing it in your mind. It's about making a commitment in your heart. And if you're sitting here this morning, you're saying, I want to make that commitment to Jesus. I want to make Jesus Lord of my life. Would you follow me in this prayer? But I want you to remember, this prayer is not a magical prayer because it's all about your heart. Where is your heart at with Jesus this morning? 
But the Bible does say that we need to confess Jesus with our mouth. And we want to give you that opportunity this morning. So right where you're sitting, just quietly, you and God, just between you and God, just pray this prayer. Just say, Father, I need your son, Jesus. And right now, I'm asking him to come into my life and to save me from all of my sins. Thank you, God, for your son, Jesus, who came to this earth, died on the cross, so that I could have eternal life. But thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for rising from the dead. If you just prayed that prayer, in your worship folder, there is a tear-off there. Would you tear that out? Would you just mark that box that says, I'm committing my life to Christ? We want to just pray for you. We're excited for you. We want to help you on this journey of knowing and understanding what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. Father, we thank you so much for all that you do for us. We thank you for this great morning that we can come together and just celebrate moms. But Father, also learn from the life of Mary about what faith is all about.